I asked my other class if they do mind, next time I have you, we can uh, cover interference and diffraction and photoelectric effect. So cover both and give you around 10 days to submit each, like five days to submit each. So we would be done in 10 days. So probably we can have an early final exam or have a break of a week before the final exam. So probably I need to finish grading your work and have a review session with you and so on and so forth. Okay, do you want that? Doctor, can I ask you something? But I hi. بس الافج تبع هذا متعب يعني كان عارف انه قد ايه طلع اكيد فيكم تعرفوا كل شيء بدكم اياه فيكم تعرفوا all right so this is something that i can show you this is my first class the average is 63 before the raise i think 73 after the raise because we add 10 points and uh, this is my second class which is you the average is 58, and then with 10, it's going to be 68. Uh, the reason why... No, 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 first class. We are the first class. Okay, I'll put them in the order. It's not the first Okay, so the idea is that uh, we added 10 points only because we have, I think, many students with 100% after the race. So the students who hit 100% are the students who limited us. Otherwise, I would easily give you a 20%. Mission Heike, I'm not happy with the raise. Mission Heike, we said, let's lower the percentage of the midterm. And I'm ready to cancel the midterm if you end up doing well. And I'm going to push for that. So for the students, but there are no people who are doing it. I would say for the students who would do better in the final exam, I'm ready to cancel the midterm. But I cannot officially state this as a statement yet until we see how things will go. Okay, so for the students who did not well, I'm ready to push you as much as possible. Look at Carl, for example, he has 91%. Okay, uh, I can show you some students. This is 96% in my class and other classes, but I'm not, uh, I don't have the right to show you other classes. I have one of the classes, they have two students having 100%. So you see those are limiting us in a way. But since the average is not great, we can easily ask for more by changing the percentages. Okay? So, shall we start with lab seven a bit? So what we have here is, I want to show you quickly lab seven. Uh, let me go a bit to the previous class I have. What I did for them, and I'm doing the same thing for you after class, hopefully in the evening. I uploaded for them lab seven. You know lab seven was empty. You only had the PowerPoint and the recorded session. I added the experiment to the video of the experiment and the results for the lab report and the assignment to submit. And for lab eight, we did the PowerPoint, we recorded the session and the experiment and the results and submit. So hopefully I can do that with you by the end of today, all right? So, are we ready to uh, check for lab seven? So today I'm gonna cover lab seven and eight. Seven, uh, seven is already done, this is lab seven. I just want us to go over the experiment quickly and start lab eight, which is the continuation of lab seven, the experiment and what you need to do. Yes, do you want to do that? Please speak up. Because otherwise I would think I'm disconnected. Yes, doctor, yes. All right, let me fetch the video of experiment, the lab. So optics one, I'm gonna fast forward, as you know, because you can watch it later. All right, so you are given a piece of metal that is super reflective. I'm gonna use this as a mirror. You have the flat surface of the mirror, the concave surface on, of the mirror, and the convex surface of the mirror. I'm gonna use it, explain what it is, uh, show you the ray box, this is called a ray box. As I rotate the opening of the ray box, I can have a beam of one ray, a beam of three different colors, 
a beam of five rays that are supposedly parallel, and you can see the error in here. And I can have a beam of three rays. Do you see the three rays? As I move my hand a bit, let me move, yeah, it doesn't show. You see the three rays? And a beam of one ray. And then I uh, get the flat mirror, and you can see the incident ray, the reflected ray. You can, with a pen, you can easily get a pen and draw the surface of the mirror, locate your incident ray, locate your reflected ray, then you remove the ray. By the way, I'm doing that in complete darkness. This is your mirror, so I can easily draw the incident ray, the reflected ray, show the arrows, they are important, show the mirror, then draw the normal to the mirror to be able to measure the angle of incidence and angle of reflection, okay? So using a simple protractor. And then I can repeat the experiment for different angles. You see, I'm rotating my mirror because I want different angles. Yes, so that's it for the first part of the experiment. Now for the second part of the, oh, also they want you to answer a question that is, what happens if you have three different colors? The order of the colors, does it change? And the angle, does it change? So please use the video to be able to observe and answer this question. So everything observable should be taken from the video. Everything measured should be taken from the measurements provided for you in the lab report. Now I want us to move to three rays. And instead of the flat mirror, I'm going to use the concave mirror. And you're going to see that a cylindrical beam will be reflected. It will become a converging beam. And you see that the rays actually meet at this point. This is not the focal point. It's the secondary focal point. You want the primary focal point. To reach the primary focal point, you just need to make sure that the mirror is perpendicular to the rays. So in this way, like this, not like this, like this, just perpendicular. So, and then try to locate the focal point. If you cannot locate the focal point, locate an area of intersection and find the midpoint of it, assuming it's the focal point. So I'm gonna say this is where my focal point is. Also, it's important to draw the surface of the mirror to be able to measure the distance between F, the focal point, and the surface of the mirror in a regular ruler in centimeters, two decimals, or the smallest subdivision divided by two is your uncertainty. Then I'm gonna take the surface of the mirror and try to slide it parallel to itself. My job is to find the radius of curvature. And then I try to demonstrate any random arc or uh, part of a circle and show you by doing a chord, finding the midpoint, doing the perpendicular, and another chord, finding the midpoint, doing the perpendicular, you can find the center of any arc. Okay, by finding the center, you can easily measure the radius because you are required to find the focal length and the radius of the mirror and compare them. Okay, so I can do this and that, find their center, find the radius, and then compare. A new paper now to be able to see what happens, I think, dispersion. No, not yet, or is it, yes, dispersion. I'm gonna take my, uh, what do we call it? my prism, not the prism, it has a name. Anyway, the piece of glass given to you. And I'm gonna use it for refraction, yes. So how do, I, how do I do it for refraction? I draw the first surface and the second surface. I draw the incident ray and the emerging ray. By the way, the emerging ray is not the refracted ray. The refracted ray is inside. I'm gonna draw both. Now remove the ray, draw the incident ray, draw the emerging ray, and eventually join what's inside, because what's happening inside, that's weird, I just had a message from my child and she doesn't know how to write. Who wrote it for her? Anyway, so uh, I'm gonna join what's inside because I cannot I cannot see what's inside and cannot draw. So by simply joining and then draw the normal to the surface, I can find the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction. So remember, 
You want the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction inside the prism or whatever you want to call it. And this is nothing. I'm not going to use the emerging ray. Measure with a simple ruler, a uh, protractor, and then do the thing over many different angles. So by simply rotating your prism, you can you find different angle of incidence and find the corresponding different angle of refraction. Okay? And then I'm gonna get a prism to do the dispersion. And I want to check what Reem wants. Do you mind? Because this is the first time ever she types something for me. Oh my God, but I cannot. First time. No, no, I cannot answer this. She, she just sent me an audio. Yeah, Allah, she wants me to send her the music that says ooh, 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 ooh. I need to call her later, but I hope it's not for school and it's not urgent. Anyway, I have this prism and I'm using the tip of the prism, you know, to be able to separate white light to different colors. Okay, so I'm going to rotate it until the ray is basically touching the surface. And I don't know if you see it on my thumb. I actually see it very well, but probably not using the camera of my phone. I can see red and yellow now, but in the lab, I could see green as well. Okay? And so just observe the video and write what you see on the video. And if I can continue, and I'm, I'm trying to tilt the paper a bit, you can see a bit of green in here. Okay? So just answer the question. Now green is, green is basically visible answer the questions by observing the video all right so you can see red obviously yellow a bit and green is not really obvious so they will ask you the order of the rays and which one disappears first and so on and so forth you can tell from the video eventually they ask you what happens if you are given three different colors and what happens to the order of the rays and the angle of the different rays and you can also do that now for the, you have to do the total internal reflection. So I'm gonna get the prism again. And this is the incident ray. This is the refracted ray, like the emerging. I'm gonna rotate my prism in such a way that the emerging ray is gonna disappear. And to be precise, I don't want it to disappear. I want it to reach exactly grazing the surface of this, the, this, you know? So I'm gonna move this a bit, okay? And keep on rotating it until the emerging ray just grazes the surface and you can barely see a very faint light. You see, there's a red faint light. I'm gonna say the angle of incidence is equal to the critical angle, like equal, not more, not less, because I still have a very faint red ray that is grazing the surface. Now I'm gonna draw the prism and draw, I'm drawing the prism with a pen, then draw the points of the emerging ray and the point uh, of incidence and the point here where the thing is happening because I can see a white, all right? So I need those three points to be able to draw what's inside the prism. Using a regular ruler, I can draw. So this is the incident ray. This is the reflected ray. And the refracted ray is grazing the surface. So I can easily draw the normal and measure the angle of incidence and measure the angle of reflection. And I can say that this is theta critical and this is theta critical because the incident angle is theta critical and the reflected angle is theta critical. So the whole thing is two times theta critical to be able to measure theta critical. And I did the measurements for you, wrote them down in the lab report and sent you a copy of my lab report. Okay, so here I'm gonna show you, I want you to focus on the reflected ray. It's very faint. As I rotate my prism, the reflected ray is gonna have a better brightness. So you see the brightness is increasing as I'm rotating the prism. And this is the brightness you can have, the brightest you can have. So this is faint. 
and this is bright. And as the refracted ray disappears, the reflected ray became, becomes very bright. And this is the point of me rotating the prism to be able to observe incident, refracted, and reflected. And again, this is the surface of separation I need to discuss. So when I say incident, it's incident to this surface, reflected, reflected to this surface, and refracted is refracted from this surface. So ignore the first and the last one because nothing is happening on those surfaces, okay? So that's for lab seven. I will definitely share the link with you and you're gonna take your time to watch the video later on and now that you have the lab report with results, most probably you can do the lab report in one shot. I remember on the PowerPoint of lab seven, I wrote due date to be on Wednesday. And then the first section asked the due date to be on Thursday. So you guys do whatever you want. Make sure you submit before Thursday, okay? And again, let me show you the lab report and not talk about it while it's hidden. So basically you have nothing to do. All the results are given to you. You just have to answer some questions and I suppose you can do it easily. Yes, this Thursday. So I wanted you initially to present this on Wednesday and they asked for one extra day. So results given to you answer two questions. Results given to you answer two questions. Results given to you find n and the average answer one question. It's not like you have to plot or do anything. It's over, that's it. So I think if you do it now, you can finish it in 20 minutes. But I know until I upload it, let me give you until Thursday, okay? Jana, does this make you anxious to submit this week? Let me know, Jana, if you have difficulties on this level. The point is not to stress you out. I just want to give you a structure. And now for lab optics two, you can do it for next week, okay? Optics two is even shorter than optics one. The reason is, let me find it because I have so many windows open. So let me, yes. This is optics two. I wrote the deadline to be next Monday and then your other friends section asked for it to move until Tuesday. So I said, okay, so the deadline is gonna be Tuesday. Cool. Or any day before Tuesday, you can do it tomorrow if you want. So I was saying, this is a very short lab. Again, optics one and two were initially one lab and they are split into two. So we have experiment only mini experiment one, two and three. Cool. What is experiment one? You're gonna play around with convex and concave lenses. Can you tell me the difference between convex and concave? Convex is converging yes. and concave, concave diverging. Okay, and what's the difference? Can you tell the difference by looking at them? Uh, no, the, the convex, you know, I can't really draw it, you know, I can't can visualize it. And the con concave, the con, you know, when I miss a uh, pin, or by then at the edge is thicker, well, the convex bracket. Exactly, so you can tell from the shape of it, it's very thick in the middle. The, concave, the convex lens. And the concave lens is very thin in the middle. And can you tell me a bit about the behavior of a light beam or a cylindrical beam whenever it goes into the convex lens? Yes, so the behavior or anybody else can tell me about the behavior of a light beam whenever it goes into the convex lens. So this is a convex lens. And let's say we have a cylindrical beam. What happens to this beam? Does it continue undeviated? Does it emerge uh, uh, diverging or converging? Anyone? Can, can I, yes? Can I speak? Yes, of course, you can say. Uh, it continues passing by the focal point, right? Okay, which means it converges, it converges exactly to the focal point. So if I move to this slide and move away the chat box, I can see this to be the converging action of a con convex lens. And this is the diverging action of a concave lens. And I know in the course you call them convex and concave, although in some other books they call them converging and diverging. <clears throat> I'm gonna do exactly the same experiment five rays, 
meeting at this point. And I'm going to measure the focal length because this is the lab report for the convex lens and for the concave lens. All right. Be careful when you measure the focal length, you're supposed to measure from the focal point to the center of the lens not to the surface of the lens, because while I was doing the experiment, I was measuring to the surface of the lens, and then I noticed, no, it has to reach point O. Uh, this is the video, if we can uh, watch the video in parallel with our presentation. So you can see that I used a beam made of three rays. This is the con convex lens, and this is the concave lens. For the convex lens, I placed it on the paper and you can see that a parallel beam will actually converge and the focal point, I couldn't tell where it is. So I know the region where the rays actually meet and the midpoint would be my estimation of the focal point. And then it's very important, do you see here, I drew the lens, the drawing of the lens, it's not very visible. So now I should measure not to the surface, you see the mistake Jesse did, but to the center. Honey, I fixed the mistake. All right? It's very important to measure the focal length from the focal point to the center. And then I repeated the same exact experiment, showing that those rays do not actually meet. I'm supposed to make them meet on the other side of the lens to find the focal point. Did, they, did I actually do it? Yes, I did. I also explained that the fact of elongating the rays actually is an estimation and a lot of human error could be involved in here. And I showed you that the three rays are supposedly, should supposedly meet at one point, and in my case, they did not. But now looking at the video, I can see that I have a tiny deviation in here. So probably I should have elongated this in a better way. But anyway, if the meeting point is not exact, you can take the average or the midpoint, okay? And I think this is what I did. I, take, I took the midpoint, it doesn't show, but it shows. And now measure the focal length from the midpoint to the surface of the lens. By the way, after uh, recording the video, I tried it again to show you, uh, to do an actual good, better measurement to be able to give you a reasonable focal length to do the... Uh, calculations okay now back to the powerpoint what they want you to do is nest uh, two uh, converging and diverging lens together and see what happens and they want you to slide the convex and the concave lens apart and see what happens so observe the video and try to uh, describe so these are two lenses nested together and see what happens if you separate them or a switch, if you switch them, because I've been switching them back and forth, so you see what happens, okay? All right, now, for the second part, they want you, so this is experiment two. Let me make this smaller, not possible, put it away. All right, lens maker equation. Uh, do you remember the lens maker equation from the course? Anybody remembers the lens maker equation from the course? Yes? Okay, Jana, that's good because in the other section they don't remember it. Uh, this lens maker equation is interesting because you need it for MCAT. I saw it for, for on many uh, multiple choice questions. What is it basically? It's an experimental equation and it's an empirical equation. Like we got this equation out of experiment. That's why you can see it's an approximation, all right? F is the focal length of the whole lens. And remember, the lens is made of surface one, surface two, and the material in between. So surface, the material in between, this is N, the index of refraction of the material. R is the radius of curvature of the first surface. R2 is the radius of curvature of the second surface. Now, my question for you is, how do you find the radius of curvature of a certain surface? Can you please speak up? How do you find the radius of curvature? By the way, we have many methods. Can you come up with one? All right, so Jana and Dana gave me two different methods. 
uh, Jana said, draw the circle. And yes, I did that. Like elongate this until you get the full circle and then find the, ray, the center or draw two chords and find the center and the find, measure the distance between the center and the surface. Yes, this is one method. Another method stated by Dana, F over two. All right, Dana, can you tell me what you mean by F? Because it makes a difference. And yes, you have a point, Dana, but what do you mean by F? Focal length. Focal length of who? Of the lens? All right, so Dana is saying that the focal length is equal to half the radius, okay? Basically, this F is not the focal length of the lens because the focal length of the lens is given by this equation. And as you can see, this equation is different than this. And how come you can relate the lens to only one radius? You have to relate it to two radii because the lens is made of one surface and another surface and the material in between, which is, uh, in this case, uh, acrylic lens, acrylic, some kind of plastic. All right, so no, it's not the focal length of the lens. It is the focal length of the mirror. Because as you remember, we did an experiment one, mirror, no, 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 no. What did we do? I think back in optics uh, one, and this is what Jana is referring to. In optics one, we had a convex mirror and you found the focal length and you said the focal length of reflection it's half the radius. Now, if you look at your lens, which is here, it acts like a mirror sometimes, because you know the window outside, which is next to me right now, can act as a lens because I can see some rays, they go through it, and also it acts like a mirror because I can see the image of my face. All right, Ryan. So basically, I want you, Dana, to use this lens as a mirror Yani, look not for the refracted rays, but for the reflected rays. And sometimes they are very faint. I don't know if you can see them here, but you have a tiny bit of reflection. Let me see if we can see reflection. Do you see reflection happening here? If you look at the reflected ray only, okay, I'm looking back if I can see some reflection. You see the reflected ray here? You have a tiny bit of reflection. Where is it? You see the reflected, not the refracted, the one reflected. If you can focus on it and find the focal point, this is F we're looking for. I need to turn it a bit. Okay. So yes, what I was telling Dana, if you look for the refract, the reflected ray, FR, it will be equal to half the radius, okay? So find the radius, any method you want. And here it says something interesting. It's not necessary to measure the curvature for both sides because they're equal. And it says also that N is equal to 1.5 for this uh, material. And it says that re remember that a concave surface has a negative radius of curvature. Otherwise, you will have one over R1 minus one over R2 to give you zero. But if you take one of the radii to be negative, you will end up with an addition to be able to find F. So the focal length is measured from experiment one, the previous slide. Uh, the radius of curvature will be given to you by me. And then you calculate using the lens maker equation, the focal length of your lens and then compare find the percentage difference and then comment discuss the sources of errors any questions related to experiment two so the most confusing part is how to find the radius and you have two methods to find the radius either by direct measurement or do the reflection find the focal point of reflection then multiply by two i hope this is not confusing for you shall we move yes can I ask a question? Of course. Uh, how, how do we assign uh, R1 or R2 positive negative? All right, good question. And uh, okay, this is a concave mirror. 
right? Am I right? Yes, I'm right. Yes, the other one is convex. So which means this will be taken as concave, yani negative, and this will be taken as convex, yani positive. Okay? If you want to be on the safe side and for you not to be confused between R1 and R2, simply, and by the way, R1 and R2 are given by this figure. This is R1. It's the first one facing the light. And this is R2. I'm sorry, I messed up your slide, but it's okay. So if you are confused, how about you do absolute value? In other words, uh, do the addition and take the values of R1 and R2 similar. So you'll end up with 2 over R. And F, it will be absolute value. All right? And I think they will only do the calculation for a concave lens. Distance. They take the, the course, they put in the side where the light is coming from. This is the negative R. Yes. Yes. Is that, is that correct? Say it again because I can't hear you well. The side where the light is coming from, this is the negative R. Exactly. Which oh, means R1, yeah, which means R1 is going to be negative. And R2 is going to be positive. So you'll end up with a negative value. So F is going to be negative. F is going to be negative, which is normal because we're dealing with a, with a diverging lens. And for a diverging lens, F is negative. OK? So what Sana sa Jana said, she said that R1 is negative and R2 is positive, I'm talking about this example, okay? So R1 is the first surface, it's a concave surface. R2 is the second surface, it's a convex surface, so it's positive. If you do the calculation, you end up with F negative, which is normal, okay? Yes. But again, what you will have here is an absolute value of F. So add a minus to it, because I remember that this is your lab report. Let me show it to you. Lab report, lab report. And I wrote the values, the measurements only. So just a second, because I just closed it. So I wrote the focal length and absolute value. So feel free to add any minus sign you want. Can we do absolute value and if convex, we keep it positive, but concave negative? Anthony, if you want, do them all absolute value, but don't do R minus R because you will end up with a zero. This is the only thing that would really, that would worry me. So do it all absolute value if you want for the sake of the experiment, but not later on in the course, because in the course you have to be careful with this, but make sure you, don't, like, if one is negative, the other is positive, you end up with an addition, if you know what I mean, Anthony. Okay? So, I'm sorry I confused you. This is supposed to be very simple. I need to move for experiment three, if you allow me to. Do you have any questions before I move to experiment three? Any questions? before we move to experiment three. Please speak up. All right, thank you Yara for responding. Now experiment three, you will learn how to find N. So the purpose is to find N, the index of refraction of a certain material using a method called apparent depth. And this method is a general method you can either do the parallax method or the ray tracing method. The ray tracing method is much simpler because the parallax method, you have to use your eyes and this is very subjective, but I will try my best to explain it, okay? So, so far to find N, how do you find the N of a certain material? Can you suggest a method? Let's say I'm drinking beer and I look at the piece of glass I'm holding and I want to know and the index of refraction of the bottle of the glass. Can you come up with a method to find it? I need you to speak up and to give me a method to find and the experimental method. 
Come on, n, the index of refraction. How do you find it? It's very easy. Can, can we uh, maybe um, put an array of light incident onto the glass and then uh, measure you know, the, the angle of refraction? And then we, according to n1 sine theta 1 equal n2 sine theta 2, because we know n1 in air is 1, so we can calculate n2. All right, and Joe is saying use Snell's law, which is exactly what you said, Jana, to be able to do n1 sine i1 is equal to n2 sine i2, and you can find n easily. Yeah, this is a good method, but unfortunately, you need a protractor and a ruler and a pencil, and sometimes you don't have all this if you are drinking a beer somewhere on the beach, you know? So, what are the two methods that you can add to your library? The apparent depth method, you will be given a piece of prism, a piece of glass, I mean. You draw a line on a paper and you put the glass on top of the paper and you look through the glass. Let me get the video again. So where were we? We were actually doing this. Let me move fast forward. Yes, and here. Okay, let me fetch the final experiment. So. I just drew a line on the paper. This is called object. Now I'm going to put the piece of glass and look at the image, the image of this object. Do you see that the image looks closer to my eye, closer to the camera, which means the image is closer, like higher. I'm going to call T the thickness of the whole piece of glass and D the depth of the image and the image is here. So you can see in red the object and in blue the image and the image which is a virtual image is higher than the object. Now the question is how can I locate the position of the image? I'm gonna hold a pencil still, do you see the pencil? And I'm gonna estimate where the position of the image is. Give me the amal estimate. I'm gonna look through this picture and put a pencil, and you can see me doing the experiment myself. This is a pen that is super sharp. Where's the pen? Pen. And I'm gonna try to estimate the position of the image. I'm gonna say probably it's here. Then I'm gonna close an eye, one eye, the right eye, then the left eye. If with the right eye and the left eye, the pen stays aligned with the image, it would be, it would say that my estimation was very accurate, all right? Let's say I close an eye and I see the pen like not aligned with the image, but like translated because you will actually see it so much different with your left eye or with your right eye. If you see the alignment broken, it says that your position of the pen is wrong. So you're gonna try it for different positions and check for which position the alignment is not broken by simply closing an eye or the other, okay? And you can simply trace with the pencil on the piece of glass, and I showed you here how you have something on the piece of glass. Do you see this red point? And you can use a regular ruler to be able to measure the depth and the thickness using a regular ruler, and I did that in front of you on the camera. So this is called the parallax method. And parallax method is when you try to estimate the position of the image, it will be D, the depth of it, and T is the thickness of the whole thing, all right? And then fill in the table, parallax method, what is D and what is T, and then find N using this equation. Any question on the parallax method? It sounds weird, but I guess it's a very good estimation and eventually you can tell which method is more precise and probably this method would give you a good precision. What's cool about it, you don't need a protractor and any sophisticated something. You just need any object. It doesn't have to be a line, so you don't need a pencil. You can simply, if you are in a restaurant, use the menu, any line on the menu, your bottle of beer, and then try with a key, your key holder or something to try to locate the position. Oh, but yeah, then you need to measure a bit to be able or probably estimate D and T, 
half a quarter or something because the ratio is what matters for you to be able to find n okay yes so any question related to the parallax methods yes Please speak up, otherwise I would think I'm disconnected. All right, thank you, Anthony, for responding. Now, for the ray tracing method, it's very simple. You just have to follow the recipe. What is the recipe? You have five rays in here. You block three because you want two rays that are far away. You block them with anything. It could be an eraser. I used a mirror or anything to block the ray. Then. You put a convex lens because you want your parallel beam to become a converging beam. Now the converging beam will meet at point F, the focal point. Put your piece of glass at the point of intersection and observe the emerging rays. The emerging rays will be deviated just a bit and if you elongate them, the meeting point will be here. So I'm gonna say with purple, this is the meeting point and in green, this is the image of the meeting point. And you can see you have some deviation. So T is gonna be the thickness of the whole thing and D is gonna be the depth of the image of the point of intersection, the real point of intersection. Very easy to do and you can see it on the video. Uh, I actually did it a few minutes ago. So I'm gonna go backwards. So this is a beam of five rays. I used a mirror to block three rays. I have two parallel rays far away, Conver uh, converging lens. The rays actually meet at this point. Now I'm gonna approach the rhombus or whatever you wanna call it to be at just touching the intersection. Okay, at the intersection, I'm gonna draw the piece of glass, draw the emerging rays, then I'm gonna remove it and connect those rays and find the point of intersection. And you see the point of intersection that was supposedly here has moved to this point. Okay? And you can easily measure D and T. Okay? So here I'm showing you that those rays were actually deviated because of refraction. And this ray was actually deviated because of refraction. And both rays are getting closer to each other. That's why if you elongate them, you get to this point. Okay, yes, so that's it for this uh, method. And I can see it's easy and probably more precise because you don't need to estimate stuff. It's only the elongation of the ray that would be somehow critical. Otherwise, uh, you have no issue whatsoever. So I'm gonna use this method to find D and to find T and to find N again. So. I'm gonna use the, this method and this method. So you will have two different values for N. You can compare it to the actual N of acrylic. You are given three significant figure and tell which one is closer. So discuss precision and accuracy through this method. And you can see this lab is even uh, smaller than the other lab. And now that the measurements are given to you, you can do it in 15 minutes. I'm so sorry you're missing the experiment. I'm glad I recorded this video for you because as I was uh, discussing with your other friends, I really feel bad recording those videos. By the way, the gray videos are recorded by me and I'm fetching some videos online that are the orange videos. Just look at your lab. So probably interference and diffraction, photoelectric effect. I'm gonna take the recording of somebody else, but I'm gonna explain it all myself, okay? I, find a, I found a very nice and easy video to follow done in Beirut, and the equipment are very similar. So I'm gonna use that while explaining how to fill in the lab report and explaining the theory, okay? Any question related to lab two? I mean lab eight, which is optics two. So that's it.